because I love you all and I'm here to help you and guide you towards understanding that life does not have to be a big drama. And I know that it's very easy to let go of people in our lives who uh, may not be particularly connected to us. They could be a distant friend of a friend or some work colleague that works way down on the other side of the building. So you can pretty much, you know, ignore them, smile, nod and keep going and it doesn't impact you. The fact of the matter is that um, obviously the closer someone is to you in importance to you, the greater the expectation we have on them to meet our needs, to, to fall into the idea of what it is that we are uh, expecting in the relationship. So it really in the end does come down to our expectations. We don't expect as much from strangers. We don't really expect as much from, uh, you know, we're even a, a work colleague to a degree, we don't, you know, a lot of us, you know, that have work, you know, the nine to five kind of uh, gig, we end up, you know, gotta stop saying, you know, I'm sounding awfully Australian with the, you know, gotta figure out something else to shove in there other than, you know, anyway. Gosh, now I don't know what to say. Anyway, so <laughs> us move on. So we don't need to uh, have that that kind of experience where we are dreading dealing with people, and where we fear that if the next time we meet uh, is going to be um, the same problem, the same dreadful experience that we had before. So. This is a welcome. So today's talk is say, staying sane during the holiday season. And as I was saying, when families get together, we have big expectations. And a lot of us have a little, only a small amount of patience, even though we've got the big expectations of the happy family. And some of those expectations are coming from the fact that we do have, you know, a society that uh, has big you know, we have the movies, we have the, 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 the songs, we have the whole hallmark idea of the Christmas, Thanksgiving, Christmas get together uh, or any other, you know, uh, any other seasonal holiday or uh, religious holiday. So it's not just for Christmas or Thanksgiving, but that's commonly what's going on at this time of year. So any time that we need to gather together with our beautiful family and our friends, we carry into that occasion an expectation that it's going to be happy, that we're all going to get along. Well, at least that's the hope. That's in the background. We hope for that. We also, sadly, many of us carry another bag of expectations into a family gathering, and that is that maybe Auntie Jill or, you know, um, Uncle John or our parents or Grandpa. Robert, thinking of names, something off the top of my head. Anyway, any, any of these relatives are, are going to come with the same bag of annoying tricks that they have come to previous family events. And we then carry with us an anxiety and a dread and a worry that we're going to have to deal with that. And I know exactly like what that's all about because I had that with my dad. And, my, and the family events with my dad. And so today's very mini masterclass, I will be using the example of how I managed to release decades of dread, anxiety, worry, dress rehearsing in my mind before going to the event. Uh, about, well, he said this, he said that, I've got to, I've got to say this, I've got to respond like that. And he, he does this. Uh, you can imagine that whenever I went into any family event, and I was prepared for battle. I mean, I Mosul have been wearing the suit of armor to really make it obvious because I was certainly internally wearing that suit of armor to go into any engagement at that time with my dad. And so today in, in talking about and, and my dad and explaining it from that way so that you can sort of see how it all kind of falls together, Within that example, I will be showing you where our emotions are coming from. I'll be telling you about the truth about 
our human experience where conflict come, comes from, so the cause of conflict. I'm going to show you how you can be okay even in disagreement. We have a, a, a generalized story out there in, in, in the wider community that we all need to be on the same page. You hear that out there, certainly in the coaching community. Everyone needs to be on the same page in order for everything to be okay that we have to come to uh, consensus. We need to be compatible. Um, this is not true. You can actually be okay in the presence of even the most objectionably oriented person, you know. So that next family gathering where you are in the company of, you know, the Ku Klux Klan member, the, the arch racist of the family that you really want nothing to do with, you can actually be okay in their presence. Not saying that you need to keep dialing up and seeing them every week, not saying you need to go to a meeting with them, but it is actually possible to be okay with people who have completely different opinions to you, views to you, ways of living with you. It does not automatically need to lead to, lead to uh, a huge argument and um, cutting off and things like that. We, we don't have to do that. Doesn't mean that you're going to change your view necessarily. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to change their view either, but we can still be okay. And so it's being okay, not just in Overall, what the things that I'll be talking about doesn't just mean being okay in a one-off family event where you all go back to your separate corners at the end of it. What I'm talking to you today, you'll be able to be okay no matter what, in your daily life, in your normal family setup, in your normal work setup, where it's day in, day out, the same understanding applies to that. So it's not just, oh, well, yeah, this is okay. I can brace myself and be okay for a once a year event and then never see them again for another year, deep breath. It's not about that. And this is what's beautiful about the three principles and the inside out slash inside out paradigm perspective that I come from. So, have you ever heard that toxic people drain your energy with their negativity? I know I've heard that said. That said heaps. We hear it a lot out there that people drain. So we need to protect our energy. We need to, uh, you know, we're not going to be okay unless we've got barriers up and walls up and, and people pushed away physically and or energetically that you need to cut contact with these people in order to be okay. And I'm going to show you how cutting contact is, is actually not the answer in the end. Um, of course, disclaimer right here, if you are in any physical harm from anybody at all or your children or whatever, if, if you are in physical harm in the presence of somebody, of course you seek safety you do not put yourself in harm's way the first lesson of the harmony of being you know within in harmony with the universe um in in keeping with our divine sacred spirit and in with with god is that we are not in harm's way we do not put ourselves in harm's way and we don't cause harm to others. So that is the basic disclaimer of the universe. It is, we have a benevolent universe, a benevolent God. We are by nature spirit beings and we are spirit beings of unconditional love and compassion. That being said, certainly from the Buddhist perspective, compassion comes in two forms, the peaceful compassion and the wrathful compassion. The wrathful compassion is is not done from anger, it is done from a space of love. When we remove ourselves from physical harm and prevent others from harming us, we are in fact doing it 
uh, from a space of compassion for that sentient being as well, because if we remove ourselves from harm's way, we are in fact prevent, preventing that other person from accruing bad karma, wrongdoing, how, whatever framework you want to come from. The universe doesn't like oppression. God doesn't like oppression. Things don't work well for people who are causing oppression. So in fact, when we set boundaries for ourselves with love and compassion, around other people and remove ourselves from physical harm, we are in fact doing um, a service, a public service to those who would actually cause us harm. So I am not talking about remaining in contact with people who are a physical danger to you. What I am talking about here is your basically okay relationships with difficult family members and friends and that, that might or work colleagues they are basically within the parameter of healthy but you know there's disagreement we kind of think that they might you know we don't get on with them so well maybe we're saying language like they drain us they could be someone who complains a lot about you know, their health and finances or this or that or the other, or they might have a different political opinion. They might have a very different way of life. Whatever that perceived cause of uh, disconnect, it's that kind of person. Uh, that's that relationship I'm talking about. So please understand removing yourself from physical harm uh, is incredibly important. You need to do that. And, and also, not just physical, the, the, we know when some, even, even in the case where someone is gaslighting, uh, I've been through two abusive marriages, so of course physical harm is a physical concern, uh, we can die from it in those circumstances, so indeed getting to safety is important, in, but also of course, within toxic marriages, in abusive relationships, there is more going on than just the physical. What is actually very interesting is the things I'm going to talk about with you today, though I did not stay in my abusive marriages, thank God for that, um, this knowledge enabled me to release from those marriages and release them with good, good karma, go away, you know, go away, have your life, thank you very much, won't see you again, um, and let go of the story of why did this happen, why were they doing that, what's wrong with me, it enabled all that to let go, and had I had this knowledge that I'm telling you now, in those marriages, um, I would have been able to separate from the marriage a lot quicker. I would have been able to see the attempted gaslighting exactly for what it was. Their story, it's their story in their head. They were responding to the story in their head. And the truth is none of us are responsible for the feelings of others. So when someone is saying, you made me feel like this, that or the other, you can calmly, uh, and in full confidence and knowledge know that that's just simply not the case. Okay, so we've heard all those things that like people drain us and you've got to cut contact. So I found out that this isn't true. No one has the power to make us feel anything or to drain us except that we think it. And so what's going on there with that? Much of pop psychology, much of popular media, uh, when, when we grow up hearing this, that Timmy made us feel angry. Joan made us feel sad. Uh, I got a gift from Nana and I feel really happy. I got that job, I'm really happy. I don't have that job, I didn't get that job, I'm really sad, job, my, my work is pissing me off, um, I'll be really happy when I get dot 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 fill in the blanks, okay, we hear this a lot, this is in, from movies, this is in books, 
and songs. This is what's said around us. And in fact, a large chunk of well, pretty much everything else in psychology, in the other modalities of psychology, um, make the error of saying, even in the relationship space, and this is where I actually stand out completely differently from the rest of the relationship space, is I'll ask, pose the question, well, how did they make you feel? How did that make you feel when they did this, that, or the other? How, you know, and, and this notion that other people can make you feel anything is completely wrong. They can't. No one can make you feel anything except that you are thinking it. So how is this working? This is working because we have thoughts that come in to our mind. We don't have control over the thoughts that pop in our head. We have about 70,000 thoughts a day. Only a small percentage do we actually like have an awareness of. The rest just, they come in, they go out. So we have a thought that pops in our head. Our, our physiological emotions arise in response to said thought. So it's thought, then emotion. And then we respond to our thought created emotion the thought that we've had in response to the world outside. So our whole lived experience is in fact in our head. Yes, there's a physical reality, do not get me wrong. Uh, if I stub my toe, it hurts. If you came up and slapped me, it would hurt. You know, we die, we are physical beings as well. We have a body, it lives, it dies, it gets hurt, it gets sick. Absolutely, there is a physical reality, but our experience of this physical reality is completely in our head. And each of us have our own view, our own story. And as much as we might try to communicate to be understood and to understand, well, this is the main reason we think to communicate. But in fact, that's another thing. It's not like that. When we try and make people understand us, because we think that we need to be understood in order to be okay, we run into a whole lot of problems. We get defensive, we get judgmental, but we're, I'm now running ahead. So, okay, so it's possible to engage with other people we consider difficult without experiencing emotions and unpleasant thinking. And this is why, because we have our own story in our head. They have theirs, I have mine. We might be able to try and explain the view that we've got in our head and why uh, but it's not actually necessary to explain why or be understood in order to have goodwill we are spirit beings in a physical body so the sense of being understood that's a whole intellectual game that's our ego but underneath the flow of thought and emotion and it, what gives energy, what gives power to a thought and an emotional loop is our attention, is the story, is the meaning that we give. And what you'll see when I talk a little bit more about my dad is we more often than not have a, a completely incorrect conclusion about what we're seeing and why it's happening that way. And we're not responding to the thing that's actually happening in the present moment. We're responding to the story in our head and our stories we create, uh, we bring past uh, experiences and past conclusions, but the thing is the past is dead. It's not, it's, it's, it's there now, it's dead. It only happened once. It's never going to happen like that again. It, the universe doesn't work like that, except that we make it look like it does through our thinking or we're worried. So we're either ruminating about the past and then bringing worry about it happening again, all in the present moment, all in our head. And then we take this physical body that's having all this thinking into an event and a facing another family member and then we find that uh, we're not actually engaging with that person, we're engaging with the story in our head. 
And so hence, that's why I'm saying that toxic person, the person you've labeled as difficult, the person you've been really concerned about having to deal with, they actually may not be as toxic as you think they are. So I work from the inside out paradigm perspective, otherwise known as the three principles. And that was brought to us or coined as a framework by uh, Sidney Banks. He was in, in fact, a, a Welsh welder back in the seventies. Uh, so he, he had a, he had an epiphany of how things just all fall into place as far as our human psyche, our human experience. Now, the things that he is talking about, he did not uh, create. He did not invent all this. In fact, if you look through all the major spiritual traditions, you will see it constantly being pointed to. Much like Newton with uh, gravity, Newton didn't uh, invent gravity. He just simply found a way to explain what can't, couldn't, can't be seen, but is, is evident uh, by its impact. And so this is similar with uh, this inside out or three principles. The three principles um, is talking about the fact that it's mind, consciousness and thought. The other term being used, the inside out paradigm perspective, is to ex explain to you or show to you that we often walk through the world with an outside in perspective. We think that the outside world is the thing that's causing us to feel what we're feeling. And then we have a whole bunch of story in our head uh, and tools and techniques we think we need to use in order to control the outside world in order to be okay. Now, all living beings move towards being okay. They move towards pleasure, being okay, and they move away from pain. This is all living beings. This is including amoeba. This is, this is just a fact. So it is totally understandable that if we perceive that we're not okay, if we are having difficult emotions, if the situation we are in, we perceive as the cause of those emotions, then naturally it would make sense that then the solution that you would think you'd have is one to control or change the outside world. There are um, psychology modalities like cognitive behavioral, like NLP, that um, neuro-linguistic programming and other narrative psychological models that acknowledge that thought is in there as in the mix. Some still mistakenly believe that emotions cause the thought. Emotions don't cause the thought. Uh, and others make the mistake of believing that the solution then, if it is then, uh, um, if thought is involved uh, and you can't change the situation, then change what you're thinking. You really hear that a lot. We hear you, well, control what you're thinking. So either try and prevent the thought from coming in your head in the first place, you can't do with that. Or it's change what you're thinking, dig deep look into, analyze it, pull it to part, pick it to pieces, where did it come from, how did it get there, and then reframe it, change it, transform it. It's a lot of doing. And the beautiful thing with the three principles in the, in, in the inside out paradigm perspective is there's no doing. It's all about doing. You don't have to do anything with thought. So, because thought just, thought comes, thought goes. And it's in fact, simply a matter of not latching on to a story about the thoughts that you're having, that is the key. And if you find yourself, uh, which we will, we do, uh, we're not in a permanent epiphany state of being totally in our present centered heartful wisdom space. Sometimes we do run off with the thoughts in our head and we get stuck in those thoughts. And we, for a moment, make the mistake of thinking that the outside world is doing the stuff that it's doing and we're feeling what we're feeling because of it. And we're all sort of stuck in our thinking. But over time, with 
allowing for the insight of the truth of how things actually work, allowing it to just seep through like water through sand, just letting it seep through your life, you will find that without doing anything, you just have awareness. You have an awareness when you're stuck and you have an awareness that, oh, in good humor, oh gosh, I'm a bit stuck on that thinking, ha ha ha, you release it. And you release it without any further story and you release it without needing to change it, transform it, stop it, control it, manipulate the feelings or anything like that. It just dissolves. Awareness is like turning on the light and the darkness it is suddenly gone. This is the same. It's awareness and that's enough. So inside out paradigm researchers say 82%, uh, some, some evidence based here because I know a lot of us like evidence, from their research are saying 82% of people have reported uh, feeling consistently high self-esteem and positive changes in their marriage and personal relationships when they internalized the inside out paradigm perspective. 91% reported being significantly uh, in more control of their behaviors, thoughts and feelings. 75% reported being less depressed and 84 with less anxiety. And I can assure you that I've experienced all of that. Uh, so much so that problems aren't the issue anymore. I don't talk problems, not really. So there was a time in my life not so long ago and here's the thing it is still little glimmers of it so uh this perspective is not saying that stuff won't happen because life happens the nature of our existence has changed the nature of our existence is loss the nature of existence is one where you know it's going to we're going to have tests and trials so it's not that it's going to stop things from happening, but it certainly is going to make that when stuff does happen, we don't take it personally, we don't get all emotional, and we can in fact respond from loving kindness and compassion in, from our wisdom space in the present moment, rather than from the often inaccurate, inconclusive story in our head. So. So I had a difficult relationship with my dad and he, he still is at times, can be a little bit, um, you know, contrary. I like to use the word contrary. Yes. So, there you go. so I had a difficult relationship with my dad and that had me feeling incredibly tense, incredibly worried uh, whenever I would have to talk to him because basically my dad had been you know, my dad had been growing up, he had been uh, not displaying terribly, what I perceived not displaying so much interest. So these are the stories I told myself as I grew, grew up. Physic, like, was he physically present? Did he come to school events? Did he do this? Did he do that? No, no, not a lot. But I had a story about why. And that story was that there was something wrong with me that I wasn't interesting enough, that I wasn't something enough for him to not show up to the school plays, to come to the school concert, to have daddy daughter weekends where he'd take me places, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. I didn't have that. And the story I had was one of a, a lack in me. And when you have the story that someone is doing something or behaving in a certain way, and you attribute that to uh, a word, some lack in yourself, then naturally you get defensive. And when we get defensive, we don't like feeling defensive and scared. So then what we do is we start going on the attack. We start to make judgments about them <clears throat> because we, you know our basic intrinsic spirit does not like for us to be saying that there's something wrong with us because it's not the truth. It's not the truth. We are by nature radiant spirit beings. We are limitless like the universe. We are have the divine spark within us, each of us. So I can assure you there's nothing actually wrong with you. 
And the thing is, other people are not behaving the way they're behaving because of something they're being wrong with you. People behave, each of us, you and me included, we all behave according to the story in our head. And we each have our own story in our head. But I didn't know that at the time. So back when I didn't know this, I took it personally. And when he did some things or didn't do some things over my life that uh, I perceived that I needed or said things or didn't say things, I definitely took it personally. And I wrote a story about in my head about him and about why, you know, I was making assumptions about the, the intention behind what he was doing. Um, and of course, none of it was positive. And so I had started to build up a dread and anxiety of texting him, calling him, emailing him, going to the family lunches and dinners and all the rest of it, uh, because I perceived that he would behave in the same way that he'd done before, which I perceived as being critical um, or disagreeing, basically unpleasant. And so I didn't want to feel all that. And I perceived he was the cause of me feeling the way I was feeling. And so my, my solution in the end was to cut contact. Physically, I just, I, I physically that I, I didn't call him. I didn't email. I didn't, I, I didn't attend any functions. I didn't make any contact. Now, here's the thing. Here's the rub. My dad is notoriously uncommunicative, which I also read story into. So here's the thing. A whole year and a bit went by. I didn't reach out to him. I didn't follow him up. Well, he didn't follow me up either, which, of course, I read a whole story into as well. Um, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy, confirming what I'd already believed. <clears throat> so we could have stayed in this particular standoff of no contact, right or wrong, whatever. I, we could have stayed in it, well, forever, except <clears throat> that he is 85. And a year and a bit ago, he got cancer. Again, he'd actually had cancer about 15 years ago and they treated it and he went to remission and everything was fine and he got it again and I was um I was at a funeral of my 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 auntie so his sister's husband he was 90 when he died and I was at this funeral and for, for whatever reason I think I don't know my dad my dad must have been overseas or something because he wasn't at that funeral I went to the funeral with my big brother and his wife and we attended the funeral and in had, had a good day together as one does uh, even at funerals it's nice catching up with relatives and things like that but one of the things that stood out was my three cousins are uh, in configuration the same as me and my two brothers the daughter in the middle the oldest son the youngest son um, they are all maybe five to ten years older but the same kind of feel and what stood out to me uh, during during the eulogies was each three of them were able to stand up and talk about their personal deep connected relationship with their dad but the lovely slide shows it wasn't a dry eye in the house by the end of it of course so what struck me was thereby thereby the grace of god go i uh that could be me and my brothers one day or will be one day i mean this is a sad fact our, our, our aging parents will will die for those of us who have them still with us, they will. Uh, for those who have lost them, they know what we, they know exactly. You know what I'm talking about. So I'm watching this funeral, and I'm watching my cousins, and I'm watching them be able to have these beautiful memories, these beautiful connections, and speak on their father in a way 
that I knew that if that was me instead at that moment, I would have nothing to say. Because you know that saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. So <laughs> that was what would come to mind if I had to stand there and that were my dad and his funeral. Stuff will up, as we say. You don't want that to happen yet, but um, that that will is a possibility. And so it, it was in that moment that I realized that my spirit wants to connect with his spirit. And the only thing that is stopping me from having a relationship with my dad is me. And he can be whatever he is and he can respond or not respond or show up or not show up. But my ability to be able to have uh, something to say, my ability to perceive a connection and have a warmth in a eulogy for my father is completely up to me. So it was with that, that I had the, this, I need, uh, this needs to shift. Something needs to give. Now, thankfully, the thing that gave was that I came into my personal and professional journey into the inside out paradigm perspective. And what that has done is that's enabled me to have a relationship with my dad uh, in, on my terms. And in fact, he could be a cardboard cutout in the corner, which sometimes he probably is. He could be a cardboard cutout in the corner and it is totally irrelevant. What other people do and say and how they are is in fact completely separate to our experience of them. I, it's actually really profound. What people say and do is completely separate to our experience of them. Our experience of our relationships is in our hands. It's from us. It's the, it's the thinking that we have. And we can choose to either define our, relation, our, our relationships, our experience of the people around us from our ego, from the story in our head, or we can choose to show up open and abundant and radiant and enthusiastic from our innate heartful spirit-led wisdom, the, 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 the connection, the energetic connection to the universe. And we know that the universe is infinite in possibilities. There is an infinite possibility between two thoughts, infinite possibility. And it's only when we solidify the thought that's popped in our head with further story that we cut ourselves off from the possibility of an infinite way of being. And two spirit beings, this is what we are. I'm a spirit being, you're a spirit being, even that really you know, difficult relationship, uh, difficult family member, they are too, even a spirit being, even my two abusive ex-husbands, even they are spirit beings in physical form. And the, re and the reason that they behave the way they behave, well, I actually don't need to know the actual reason. Uh, and I didn't, uh, that was actually one of the wonderful ways of being able to let them go was the acknowledgement that I didn't have to know why the actual nitty gritty, you know, I mean, you could surmise it could be a family thing. It could be this, it could be that. They could just be mental. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the specific whys. The, the basic reason that anyone behaves any any way that they're behaving is they are responding to a story in their head, um, particularly when we're talking difficult behaviors, problematic behaviors, because our ego thinking, our ego thinking is connected to how our brain works. Our brain is all about categorizing, putting things in boxes. It's all about comparison our brain actually processes comparatively. What that means is small is only small in comparison to big. Good is only good in comparison to bad. Dark 
to light. This is actually how the brain works. And so our intellectual thinking, our theoretical and abstract thinking, our ego thinking is by its nature comparative and categorizing. But the truth of existence is it's formless. We are energy beings. We are of the same energy as the, the universe. We have a divine spark within us. We are infinite and formless in truth. That is what the truth is. But our thinking, our ego thinking tries to put form, tries to define, tries to categorize and box in what is ineffable, what is you know, indefinable. And then we get stuck. So when we look at another person uh, and then start putting them in boxes, we in the end are responding to the boxes in our head that we've put the person in. We are not responding to the energetic being that is in front of us. So I felt trapped. So back to square one, that, but you know, that and the whole thing. I felt trapped. I felt incredibly anxious, like so much so, you know, I was getting physically sick, you know, it was bodily anxious. Uh, I would be totally preoccupied. Like the event would be over uh, and I would be ruminating. I would be playing the whole story in my head. This was with dad, this was with my ex-husbands. One ex-husband, I, I, I met and married him in another country. He never came to my country. He's never sat in my lounge room. He's never sat on my lounge. He's never seen any of it, except that I was bringing him on my lounge in my thinking for a good year and a half after I'd left his country and come back to, to, to Australia. Um, so much so that he might as well have been physically sitting there. That, that's how much our thinking and when we get stuck in our story, how, how real it looks to us. It looks like it has form, but it's an illusion. So similarly with dad, I had a whole toolkit full of, well, he did this, he did this. I had, I know I need to respond in this way, in that way, the other way. And, you know, it's like energetically putting the blocks up. It's like a karate kid, wax on, wax off, do this, do that, you know. And it's like, defense, it's completely defensive behavior. And of course, when I am showing up in the present moment, like that, then I'm not going to be in the present moment. And the penny drop, drop one day. Finally, I'm, I'm, I'm at my kitchen sink. I'm about to, um, you know, finish my coffee before heading out to a big family gathering. And I had had been having a really great week and a really great day, and I was in high energy and I was feeling great. And then I started to notice quietly that I started to feel nervous. And I wasn't really paying attention to where that was coming from, but I could sort of feel it in my body. I could feel myself sort of clenching my teeth. I could feel my, my you know, hands clenching. And, I'm, and I caught myself at the kitchen sink and I'm putting my cup down and I'm going, okay, what's going on here? And I popped in to my head and I could see in the back there, I was running the old script, running the old script of what I needed to do to be prepared and armored to go to lunch. And unlike other times where I took that thinking seriously and, man and, and made it real in my experience, with this inside out paradigm understanding of knowing ah, my experience, I'm creating it right now in the story in my head, I was able to catch that. I was able to catch it with good humor and go, no, no, I don't have to go down. I don't have to get on that train. I don't have to go on that journey. That's not something I need to do. And in fact, I know fact is that I'm going to go to a lovely restaurant because my family happen to be foodies. And thankfully, my dad is in a financial position to take loads of us out to really nice restaurants. And so we go when we do go, I know that whatever I'm going to eat is going to be really tasty. And so I know that there will be at least one thing that's going to happen at that, that lunch that's going to be fabulous. That's going to be the food in front of me. So how about I just focus on that? How about I just go and focus with gratitude and uh, enthusiasm for the food that I'm about to eat and leave the rest. 
if all I manage to say in through the whole uh, lunch is this tastes really good, oh thanks, that's great, this, then that that will be a really good lunch. And so guess what? I showed up with that enthusiasm. I showed up leaving the armor behind me uh, back at the apartment and leaving it behind me and just going there with an open heart and a willingness to at least enjoy the lunch because it's going to be good. And when I did that, I found that not only did I enjoy the lunch, which I knew would be tasty, but I was able to experience the whole lunch and everyone in it, including my dad, including, well, I don't really call her stepmom, it's his second wife, but anyway, um, I won't use names, but anyway, so, like as her real name, but um, which is really what I call her, but anyway, um, I was able to enjoy their company and we actually had the best time and we were all laughing our heads off hyperventilating throughout so one none of us didn't choke um it was just a great laugh and the penny dropped he didn't change he wasn't different we didn't go into therapy together i he didn't even know i was even having the thinking that i was having you know um so it was without changing him and i didn't change my my personal views of life and the universe and everything that hadn't changed but it was a willingness on my part to have an experience that was to my choosing and it wouldn't have mattered whether they whether he still did say all those things and here's the thing once or twice throughout that lunch, he did try, he did say something that would normally have me running off and complete defensive mode and thinking that, you know, he was being critical of me or mocking me or this or that or the other or having to somehow validate or defend my belief or view or what have you. Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't run down that way. And in fact, one of the things that he sort of, uh, I could see that would normally have sent me off on a complete, you know, tirade in my mind at the very least, was that I could see that in his roundabout, ass backwards kind of way, he was actually trying to connect with me. I mean, he completely didn't understand any of what it was that he was trying to connect with me on, uh, but I could actually see that that's what he was trying to do. He was, he was actually trying to connect on an issue that he knows is one that is important to me um, in, in a clumsy, ill-conceived, not completely correct way. But nonetheless, had I got defensive, I wouldn't have appreciated his attempt. You know, for what it was, it was actually an attempt. And now I look and I go, well, okay, even, even when he does say something outrightly not so cool, um, it's his story. He's, he's saying it not to me, it's not personal. It's his story, it's coming from his experience. And even when it might be a little bit um, crummy, it's still, more than likely coming from some place of goodwill on his part, misconceived as that might be. But even if it's not, it's still his story. So this, this is how this works even in the case of dealing with actively malicious people who are actively difficult, uh, like, you know, my ex-husbands. Um, <laughs> they may, but even in those cases, yeah, I mean, I laugh now, I mean, I, you know, I used to paint them both as complete and utter psychopaths and maybe they are, maybe they're not, I don't know anymore, it does, but it's totally irrelevant if they are or are not, because at the end of the day, everyone is just responding to the stories in their head. And it's not personal. And so you can choose to just be open hearted in the present moment. And when we are open hearted in the present moment, as opposed to stuck in our head, we find that we are able to respond in the best possible way. 
um, from our inner wisdom. So, okay, we're kind of, you know, got totally lost track of doing slides and talking at the same time. So, yes, so I shared with you my, my relationship with my dad. And then, you know, that, yeah, trying to, so trying to avoid people, that's the whole thing, with both my dad and my ex-husbands, with anyone that's difficult in your life, if you've got this idea that you're going to cut contact with them and that you're going to try and avoid them, that actually takes a hell of a lot more energy out of you uh, trying to avoid people. Because the truth of the matter is, you might physically not be in their, in their presence, but I can guarantee that you've still got a story going on in your head and you're living, you're living them in your head. And that is absolutely exhausting. When you understand that they have their own reality and it has got nothing to do with you having goodwill towards them, you being able to be open in the present moment and responding from your heartful spirit wisdom, in the best possible way because you have the answers within uh when you live like that when you show up like that it does not take energy you're not exhausted because the exhaustion comes from having to think your way out of boxes and you cannot think your way into wisdom responses it does not come from our intellect it does not come from our ego and our, the story and the thinking you can't analyze your way into it it's all about release it's about recognizing that you're stuck in a story for that moment and compassionate towards yourself with a whole dollop of good humor because life is absurd and that's the way it is. You release it, you release the story and you willingly breathe into the present moment and show up in that moment with, with the wisdom that you have. And you find that when you keep doing that, because the thing is, we're not in a permanent wisdom state. So there will be times where you get stuck in your head and you just have to kind of recognize it, release it, deep breath, come back into the present moment. All our fears, all our worries, all our anxieties, everything is coming from our ego thinking that is designed to separate, designed to categorize, designed to, um, you, you know, compare. And so naturally our ego thinking is going to lead us down a garden path that is energetically not beneficial to us or to anybody else but when we respond from our innate universe uh connected to the universe divine spark within us our soul our spirit when we respond from that it's that knowing, it's a knowing, it's not having to be contrived and thought, it just is. And if within that just is, is compassion, is patience, is unconditional love, is courage, is fearlessness. It just is, you don't have to do anything to have those qualities or experiences. They are the default that we are. It's our factory setting, we just lost sight of it with all the added uh, programs and apps, we kind of lost sight of our basic factory setting. So <clears throat> in fact, like an overloaded mobile phone, <laughs> when, when, when it's been using too much memory and all the rest of it, and it's slowing down and, and, and fritzing out, one of the things we do is start removing extraneous apps that we don't need so that we get back to, and some of us even just factory reset the phone go back to the beginning well this is we're kind of the same you know all our thinking all that story that we've, we've been bringing layer upon layer of story about all manner of things in our lives and we drag it into the present moment they're all the they're all the bloatware that we don't need when we download windows 10 so um it's getting rid of them and the thing is, unlike cognitive behavioral, unlike NLP, unlike other narrative uh, modalities, the, the getting rid of is not an action. It is not a tool. You don't need to do anything. It's awareness that is sufficient. It's awareness that uh, I'm stuck, let it slide. Let it slide, let it pass, let it evaporate, because that is what thought and emotions do. They rise and they fall like the tide. You don't go running and chasing the tide to pull it in and push it out. You don't need to, it just does its thing. This is, you know, how our psychological immune system works. So we don't have to do anything, which is absolutely so fantastic. There's no lifetime of therapy. Oh, it's brilliant. So 
All that sounds nice for me, what I was saying. What about you? How's it going to work for you? Well, take a moment. Have a, have a think of the relationships in your life that you may be perceiving as being rather difficult. So imagine yourself not having to mentally rehearse the next interaction with that person, like I was having to do it, doing it in the kitchen sink, getting ready, getting ready to rumble. You don't have to do that. Imagine not having to have that pit in your stomach because that's what would happen. I'd be having this whole story in my head going and I'd be preparing. And, and of course, I did not feel good. I felt really anxious. I felt nervous and scared and it physiologically had an impact on me. You know, I felt nauseous and tense and all the rest of it. Imagine having a positive experience with this person. I know that might seem really far-fetched, even if you've had, you know, particularly if you had decades of, uh, you know, strained and difficult experiences with the person. I can imagine that right now you might think, oh, well, you know, this is talking absolute rubbish. Um, <laughs> and that's fair enough if you're thinking that. But imagine having a positive experience. Give yourself that opportunity in this present moment, and they are not around and you're not dealing with them. So take a deep breath and actually allow yourself from your heartful wisdom to imagine having a pleasant experience and a pleasant exchange. How is that feeling in your heart, in your heart space? How is that feeling when you imagine the possibility I know it may not have ever happened. I know it might seem really impossible, but just imagine, allow yourself that little glimmer of hope that just as there are infinite possibilities in the universe around you and within you as a spirit being and within them as a spirit being, that there just might be a possibility that you could have a decent interaction with them, a pleasant one. So sit with that. And that is not based on the story in your head. That is not based on because we've gotten in a room together and we've agreed to disagree in some kind of really, you know, arrogant kind of e egotistical way or um, that we've come to some conclusion that there is something we can agree on. So that's OK. It's not about agreeing. It's not about being on the same page. So long as I'm on the same page, so long as I'm compatible and everything's going to be okay. You do not actually have to be in the same page to, you can even be sitting across the table from someone who is, has such diametrically opposite views to you on life, the universe and everything, yet they are nonetheless a spirit being. They have humanity they are, have a spirit in them and you also have humanity that you can connect on a basic spirit being that you can connect on that is completely separate to the stories we tell of ourselves and others we are not the stories we tell of ourselves we are not the sum of the events in our life we are spirit beings we are constant, we are sacred, we are divine, we are radiant, we are vibrant. We are love, unconditional love, we are compassion, we are forgiveness. This is what we are at the core of our beings. Nothing's wrong with us and we're not broken. And that is exactly the same for that person sitting across the table that you think that you can't be uh, okay with and have goodwill towards simply because they've got a different story in their head than yours. Well, guess what? Everyone has a different story. Your story is different to mine. I can try and explain to you, I can be eating a strawberry and try and explain to you who has not had that strawberry. I can try and explain what a strawberry is. I can try and explain to you what it is that I'm tasting and why I'm tasting it and all the rest of it but you're not going to get it. It's not your experience. You may understand the words and the theory a bit, but you are not going to get it because it's not you having that experience. And even if I take that bite out of that, chip, that, that, that strawberry and then give you the strawberry to take a bite out of the other side, because you know, 
got mixed germs in COVID, but so, so we do that. Even then, you're eating from, you've taken a bite out of the same strawberry in the same moment, the same as I, even then, your experience of that strawberry, even though it's the same strawberry, is completely different to mine. And then we can try and have a discussion about our experience of said strawberry to try and understand how each of us have come to the conclusion about the strawberry. But in the end, it's unnecessary for the enjoyment of the strawberry. If you're enjoying the strawberry and I'm enjoying the strawberry in our own little reality from our own experiences, what is the point of trying to explain that? Can't you just be in the moment with the strawberry, two spirit beings, shared humanity, shared experience in that moment, shared experience from a from different points of view, because you will never have the same experience as me. Simple as that. But we can be energetically together in that moment and just in that moment. And when we do that, we are actually open to whatever unfolds from that without having to analyze anything. And this is what you can do in any of your relationships. So the world is no longer in control of your experience. This is the basic given fact. The core of the three principles is that you are living in the feelings of your thinking in that moment. So whether it's the past or future worry, you're bringing that story in the in, into the present moment and that is what you are uh, having your experience from. Unless, of course, you release all that story and allow yourself to be in your heartful wisdom state in the present moment and open to the infinite possibility of the universe and what can um, happen and just respond from your innate wisdom. Your innate wisdom is the wisdom of the universe infinite solutions, everything is right coming from your wisdom space. It's when we try and make decisions and conclusions and plans from our thinking that we get ourselves into a whole lot of trouble. And this, for me to say this, believe me, I've spent, I, you know, three degrees in psychology, a degree in counseling. Uh, I've spent my life, I think therefore I am, has been my motto in life. And it's not anymore because stories are great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I happen to be having to enjoy writing. I love a good story. I love good. I love watching movies. I love listening to the stories of others uh, as well. But here's the thing. We aren't those stories. And stories can be infinite. They can change them at any time, but we are actually not the stories we tell of ourselves. We are spirit beings in flesh, in bodies, in physical form. This is what we are in truth. The stories are how we've walked through this world trying to make form out of the formless. There's nothing wrong with that. So don't get me wrong. It's, not, it, it's nothing necessarily wrong with it. It's just understanding that it's we are not those things. And so knowing that means that we can write one story about ourselves. We can write another story about ourselves. Not, you know, nothing is carved in stone, as they say. So, so calm the change of heart that you're going to have when you realize, internalize, and I, guess I hope that I've pointed out through this, is this is an internalized, embodied experience. This is not about intellect. So when you've internalized and allowed it to trickle through, into the fiber of your being, what you experience is calm and clarity. You have fully realized that no matter what the other person says, um, it sees the world, no matter how they are behave, that your feelings are yours and yours alone and you don't have to take anything personally. You're walking through life, uh, walking into a one dreaded interaction like I used to with, those, with the family gatherings. You don't have to. And you may actually find that if you choose to be in the present moment with them, uh, that you actually have an unexpectedly really pleasant time. That increased compassion and, for, 
patience and forgiveness for yourself and others comes about with this, with this change of heart. And that you find that you are having a, a greater sense of certainty and the calm and the clarity and the joy uh, and the vibrancy. This is all coming from the fact that we are in harmony with God and the universe by living from a state of compassion, loving kindness, forgiveness and abundance. I feel it. I know. I know that when the fear kicks in, when I start having fearful thinking about something because I've gotten in my head about it, my heart center is clenched, just like a fist. And when I catch it happening, so uh, I either I'll catch the, the, the bodily sense and I'll catch, you know, ah, right, something, I'm, I'm thinking something. I'm thinking something that is fearful and anxious, anxious producing. I'm having thinking. So let's release the thinking, Re recognize it, release it, breathe into the heart and open it up because the truth of the matter is our universe is benevolent. We have a benevolent God and universe and everything that is coming to us, that is meant for us, is for our benefit. Even the things that appear to be wrapped in, uh, you know, black wrapping paper. <laughs> And might uh, appear to be unpleasant to deal with they are in the end still for our benefit life itself the the existence of life is one of change and impermanence and loss and trials and tests and we know that we it's not punishment though and I really want to throw that out there it's not punishment I know that there are some who have come up through ranks of different faiths with an idea that when something goes wrong it's a punishment and if something goes right it's a reward no it doesn't work like that tests and trials in life are part of being human it's what makes us human and not angels and other divine spirit beings we are not that we are humans and our human experience is one of going through these tests in life in order to learn to come back to our innate spirit wisdom and therefore connecting ourselves back with God and the universe and all the good stuff. So um, if our tests and trials in life get us to that point, well, then that's great. We know that we are on the right path. There, there are other um, thinking out there, the notion that, well, if you've, if you've got the money and the this and the that and the other thing, that it's somehow a divine reward. Um, not, not necessarily either true. Uh, there are tests in money and wealth as well. So um, different tests than the tests of poverty, <laughs> but they're tests nonetheless. Um, so that's an interesting one to uh, realize and understand. But basically, when we're in harmony with our spirit, we are confident, we are fearless with our love. It's an unconditional love, the love that is the love of the universe and God, and it's what connects us to every other spirit being. And so this is a wrap up. This is a, a wrap up of how you can show up to your family lunch and be okay or dinner and be okay i'm having a very quick look here see who might be uh, on live with me um if you are live with me ask a question and let me know if you are um, watching this in replay i want the hashtag replay i want lots of love hearts i want you to give me feedback let me know what you thought of this let me know um, your experience and i would love even further feedback after the holiday season to hear well did any of this help you to go into a family event without the uh big drama that you would normally be experiencing through the story that you're telling yourself of things that may you're saying that they're going to happen because it happened to me in the past but the truth of the matter is the past is dead and just because something happened in the past does not mean it's going to happen in the future and in fact it can't we can't cross the same river in the same spot twice it just doesn't happen that way anyway so this is a little nutshell 
on one specific um, way of being with our family members. But there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more going on. Uh, and I am excited, absolutely thrilled and excited and enthusiastic to be able to share with you in my upcoming Change of Heart program. Now, in today we we're talking family members, we we're talking, I was talking about my dad, but then I was also throwing in my experience with my ex-husbands as well. So as you can see, hopefully, that the Change of Heart program and the from the three principles and the inside out paradigm perspective of relationships it's not actually the relationship type that's um the issue it's not people it's not the outside it's our experience and so i have in fact a 100 percent solution for showing up and experiencing all and every type of relationship with calm, with clarity, with joy and enthusiasm. And therefore connecting with that other person or people from a heart for wisdom space that then fosters greater connection and greater closeness. And then when we live our lives with people we work with, family members, friends, the rest of society out there. When we live like this, when we show up, even with people that we might have a dif differing opinion to, but when we show up and are able to be in our heartful wisdom space with goodwill and compassion uh, and patience, we invite the other people to let down their guard, to let down their ego thinking that they're speaking from and to also come into their own wisdom space and then what happens in those moments is infinite the infinite possibility and it's just hopeful there's so much hope in this uh and that's why i don't actually really talk problems anymore it's not about relationship problems because when you understand that it's just your thinking in the moment, you're a little bit stuck. It may be that uh, the outcome of, in, of, of coming, of engaging with someone from, a, from your heartful wisdom space, it still may be, like with my ex-husbands, it still may be that the result is not reconciliation and that you no longer have contact with them. But what happens is you do it energetically in a way that does not keep you tied to them. And it just sends out to the universe a whole different energy. And then the, the, the impact of that in ways that we don't understand when we are energetically in harmony with the universe, even with people that we might have differing opinions with, it's, it's phenomenal, it's beyond our understanding but it is in fact how things work. And so anyway, my 10 week, I've got a 10 week program coming up December 31st. I want to end this year, 2020, where we've all been in lockdown to varying degrees. We've all been under each other's feet. Some of us in, uh, in marriages or relationships, others of us are single. Some of us are living with family members, others are not. We are having all varying experiences of the relationships around us. And I want to end 2020 transformatively with my beautiful queens. And I call you queens because you're queens of hearts. It's what I want you to be. And this was actually inspired from, um, from an affirmation card, actually. I need to think of the, 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 the affirmation card. The affirmation card was talking about taking a seat in the throne room of your heart. So coming into your heart, heart space, living from your heart for wisdom space and taking a seat on the throne of your heart. And that affirmation card just completely like reverberated with me and resonated completely because this is what this is all about. It's heartfulness. It's the change of heart program. And so you are all my queens of hearts. This is where this is coming from. 
And so it's it's a 10, 10, 10 week program, consecutive weeks, starting on December 31st, live online. So uh, initially we will be having a dedicated Facebook group just for the, for the members. Uh, and I will be doing, we'll, we'll work it out together at the time, probably all meeting in Zoom and doing the Zoom masterclass together and the live q and actually, yeah, that would make far more sense. So meeting in Zoom once a week for 10 weeks, about an hour and a half, we will do the module and then have the live Q and A and you will have daily access to me privately with WhatsApp. You will get a 60 minute private one-on-one -on -one session with me that you can take at any time during that 10 week period you know, or, or just after it, just, you know, see which one works for you. You're going to get the bonus battle free communication webinar. And I have got this really fabulous, which I love totally, uh, couples bliss guided meditation that I did uh, earlier in the year and it hasn't been released yet. And so you guys, gals, my queens, you will get the first showing of it, in fact. Yeah, I'm not going to release it until um, the program. And so the cost of it, the, the value of everything. So the, the 10 week program, the private session with me, the WhatsApps, the, the other bonus uh, webinars and the bonus meditation. The value of this package is 4,997 US dollars. I do have installment plan. I've got six month and 12 month installment plans as well for you. But today ending in 12 hours time so for those who are watching this live you've got this chance to jump in on this for the cyber monday and this is it you're never going to see it this again like this at this level this price my cyber monday offer is 497 dollars but it ends in it, it ends in 12 hours time so as of wednesday the price will be increased. It'll be up, it'll be up there with installment plans. But you can jump on in the next 12 hours because it's Cyber Monday, you can jump on for 497. And the program begins December 31st because I really think that we need to wrap up 2020 and run, in and, and run into 2021 with our hearts open hearts open this is what we need and so start 2021 with a total change of heart so this is me this is it we've probably been talking longer than I thought I was going to but that's just the way it is because you know I just love talking about this and I love doing what I'm doing and I'm looking at my phone and going yeah you know so I'm gonna look at my phone who's here who's loving who's doing who's here okay so love you all let me know what you think. Give me your feedback. Show some love. Hashtag replay. Ask your questions. Show me, um, you know, give me some insights. Reflect. Let me know what you think. And understand that the Change of Heart program, this, this Cyber Monday offer will be off the table in 12 hours time. So any Q and A's, I'm not seeing anyone live. So the Q and A's will be another day. So thank you for tuning in. And I hope, we hope that, well, that's the Royal we, 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 we hope, we hope that you can join the Change of Heart program. Thank you very much. Love you all. And looking forward to your feedback and your love and hashtag replay on this masterclass. Thank you. Bye.